Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the second Sunday after Christmas, which falls on January 3rd, 2021. We are finally in 2021. Are from Jeremiah 31, 7 through 14. The Psalm is 147, 12 through 20. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And John 1, and it says 10 through 18, and put brackets in 1 through 9, but just do the whole prologue. So, yeah, why, why you would only do 10 through 18 is beyond me. But I mean, not that you like preach on every single verse in there, but uh, you, uh, yeah, just read the whole prologue. So do we sing something for Happy New Year? I don't know any New Year songs except Old Lang Syne, and I don't think that's in the hymnal. Is it? I don't know. Uh, just keep doing Christmas songs. <laughs> yeah, because it's the second Sunday after yeah, Christmas. It it's only, right. <laughs> we're still in Christmas. We're, we're still, still in Christmas. This is yeah, the 10th day of Christmas. Day so of it's, Chris on the 10th day of Christmas, Mike. It's like, and pipers and piping, to 10 dancers dancing, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. All right. So we've got the prologue to John uh, yet again, which we had, of course, for uh, Christmas Day. So reflecting back on uh, what you preached then uh, would obviously shape what you choose to land on uh, here. Uh, but uh, couple of things that I was thinking about, uh, which actually our, our conversation from last week with regard to the promise of adoption in Paul uh, in Galatians, that one of the things that, that that got me thinking about for today, for this podcast, is we talk about, of course, that, and it's obvious that Jesus is God's son, uh, and 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 that we know, but, but it, that claim of, of Jesus being God's son is also a claim for us that we are children of God now. And, uh, and so there's a simultaneity of say, if, when we say Jesus is God's son, we are also claiming our own, uh, our own, uh, being children of God and God is our parent. And so, uh, and so you get that promise, of course, here in verse 12, that that could be a direction to take, uh, to take, what does it mean to be a child of God? That this is one of the promises of Christmas uh, is, is to make this claim uh, that, 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 that what, what Jesus has with God, the relationship that Jesus has with God, which which, which John makes a very intimate, close, uh, deep uh, relationship is also ours. And uh, that really resonated with me this year when we think about uh, the ways in which uh, relationships have, have had to adjust and adapt without that closeness and without that intimacy. And also wondering, I think people wonder, how is it that how is it that my relationship with God is maintained? How is it that I'm how is how is it that it's still being nurtured? And one of the promises of this text is is the power of that relationship and the intimacy of that relationship that is not going away, even with separation, um, physical separation from church or. or uh, and so the way we, which we might talk about that would be, I think, one one possible direction. I have a couple questions for you, Caroline, about uh, oh, John. I was hoping you were going to say that, Rolf. Yep. It starts with verse 12, since because um, I hate the NRSV translation. I think it's wrong, but I'm going to check with you. Mm. But to all who received him, okay, I'm fine there, therefore, mm -hmm. who believed in his name, he gave, and then the NRSV says, the power to become. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, the Greek says exousian mm -hmm. technetheu genesthe. So the questions about, first of all, exousian, which I would probably translate rather as the authority, authority. or the standing. It's, and mm -hmm. is, so uh, genesthe, 
you can hear the the sort of you can hear the word genesis there right right? Mm -hmm. people can hear the word genesis and obviously Mm -hmm. this whole thing is an echo of genesis Mm one but then it's an aorist middle infinitive and i you know my college greek is a long time ago and that um I don't know what that would mean. So the authority to be rather than to, than the power to become. The theological issue for me, and I'm asking it, you if I understand it correctly, is it's not really that God has given us the power to become, and now we have to exercise that power in order to become it. But rather, mm-hmm. it's the authority to to exist as. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, Rolf, and I think that's right. And that, you know, it's that kind of um, uh, language, too, that's going to, I'm just double sucking myself, yeah. Uh, This is going to be a theme that comes up in John with regard to, for example, the conversation between Nicodemus and, and Jesus, unless you are born anew again from above. And so uh, there's this is a this is a, a critical theme in John that there is that we are we are born children of God or reborn children of God or born anew or born again or born from above however you translate that anothen all three uh, but that's that's the claim that's being made um, here in in John one and then if you carry that forward uh, there is this there, there's this promise of of of, of a, a rebirth, a new creation, if you will, because of, of one's encounter with Jesus uh, so as I, the presence of God. Th- uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it's really good. I have another question. I could keep going, but uh, I'll ask this question. <laughs> before, you, before you ask that question, Ralph, I'd like to just chime in to say that's also the power of the echo back to Genesis 1, because is it, it is an echo of, of going before the fall uh, and it is an uh, echo that is uh, before the call of Abraham and Sarah, when that designation of, quote unquote, the children of God was Israel, but that was never the lone attempt, uh, uh, intention of God, that God's intention was always for the sake of those people that were scattered in Genesis 11. And so this uh, authority, I, I really appreciate you bringing that out, uh, Ralph, is actually the rebirth recreation, uh, recovery of the creator's original attention that we hear in Genesis 1. Fantastic. I love that. Um, Caroline, uh, in verse 11, oh, oh, sorry, 14 and following, it says um, the word was full of grace and truth and that we have all received grace upon grace. I'm surprised. I don't usually consider think about the word grace as being particularly uh, related to John. What's going on here? Oh, that, that's a n- nice softball question, isn't it? Um, isn't it, Rolf? Thank you for that. Is that a, is that, a, that must be like a, a post birthday present for me. Uh, I, thank you. Uh, well, okay, so Grace, that could be another, that could be like another whole theme, right? If you were going to take this preaching direction in that uh, what is it what does it mean that the birth of Jesus or the, the the Jesus becoming flesh God in the flesh this only God this unique God this begotten God according to John 1 18 uh, what does it mean that that's a that's that's grace uh, and and helping people get a sense of that um, particularly from a Johannine perspective when, it's there. The connection is here in the prologue between this of uh, this event, this the word becoming flesh as a as a God's grace upon grace moment. Uh, but then, of course, grace is never used again in the gospel after John one seventeen. And so uh, the tr- the homiletical trick here is to is to help people experience grace that that Christmas is an experience of grace upon grace. Uh, and not define it or explain it, which we're really good at doing in a lot of our sermons uh, of explaining grace and and defining it. And basically this says you can't really do that, that grace is not um, some a thing that that God possesses, but actually the very presence of God um, in a, in a in a in a way that we've never experienced before, according to 118. So uh, that's 
And I think that would be, I think that would be really powerful for people to imagine grace in that way uh, and something they haven't thought about before. So thanks for that lovely question, Rolf. <laughs> okay, I have more stuff to say, but maybe somebody else has something to say. I was gonna go to Jeremiah, <laughs> maybe we should stay here. <laughs> oh, okay, well, one more thing, uh, and then we can go to Jeremiah. But one more thing that, again, uh, I, um, I was landing on here this time around is, uh, is the reference to light. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, that, that's such a, it's such a powerful image and the way in which uh, the light is, it, it, the power of light, that the light, you know, shines in the darkness. And uh, John scholars, because, you know, scholars don't have anything better to do, uh, spend a lot of time in discussion with regard to what is the, what is the moment of the incarnation in the prologue? Is it, is it 1-5 or 114? And that's, I think, something for a preacher to consider. If we say the incarnation, like the moment of the incarnation is actually this promise of light shining in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome it. And, uh, and, and what does it mean to live in a world and, and be in a world and sort of embody Christmas in a world that asks us to adjust our eyes that, uh, to see the light when, there when, when it looks like there is none um, and give testify to the light uh, when, when it seems like um, there's just only darkness. But yet we have seen the light. And once you've seen the light, you, your eyes cannot not adjust to that light. Uh, that's the nature of sight. And so uh, we have seen the light. Our eyes are adjusted to see the light. When, when it seems like there's utter darkness. And so uh, there's an invitation here, be, partly because of, of John, not the Baptist, to uh, give witness to the light that we have seen. And uh, that would be another direction I'd take. Okay, Jeremiah. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks for the commentary. Oh, I love John so much. I always <sighs> love your take on John, Caroline. Oh, I just, oh, it's just so great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nobody ever says that about Jeremiah. No, that's true. At least not in the same way. But I, I never know. have said that about Jeremiah. I'm telling you that right now. You're trying to provoke me and it's this not going to work. This is obviously one of the happier parts of Jeremiah, but, uh, and, and certainly this needs to be set into context, I think when somebody preaches it, but it just has a resonance. Uh, for me in particular this year, in terms of thinking about hope and restoration, uh, particularly when we think about um, the, the the pandemic and and the loss, one of the things I like about the way um, the way the oracle puts it here is it's not just this notion of gathering. It's not this idea of God being um, reliable and this idea of a future in which people will be radiant and mourning will turn into joy, but it does also name the uh, the the experience. Um, when it references the, the the various kinds of people who will be brought back, uh, this idea of with weeping they will come, uh, this idea of remembering of a God who sees the suffering as well. So, something about this text to me just, um, and I know we've all we all teach students not to do this uh, uncritically, but to just to drop this into our context today, and take it as a word spoken today. Um, in light of the suffering that so many communities have seen and in light of the fear under which so many people still live, um, people who just want to be able to go out of their house and want to just gather with their group again in a, in a coffee shop or in a library or somewhere. Um, there's hope here in this passage of restored community and, and the vitality of, of, of communal life coming back. Maybe it's too soon, uh, but the church has always been about voicing, you know, hope that we can't see or that we can't yet perceive. So in that way, maybe it's more of a good New Year's sermon than a Christmas sermon, um, but that's where we are. Um, we, uh, so when you hear the word, the phrase prophetic preaching, what do you think most people associate prophetic, the, the call to be a prophetic preacher? 
What do most people associate that with? I feel like I'm being set up with the question, but I'll play. Uh, that it's an idea of, of speaking an uncomfortable truth, of exposing lies and power, and uh, and speaking up for those who are uh, who are being hurt by policies and by um, decisions that the powerful make, either on purpose or unwillingly. I think that is what most people associate it, uh, prophetic preaching with, but that's only part of it. So. Um, Hope is really the first word of the prophets. Uh, so you're talking about the marginalized and the people who have been hurt by power, which is Israel in this case, or the, the exiled Israel. And so it always has to be a word of hope then to those um, who are suffering, which in the end is all of us. But so here's this word of hope, uh, and it's not too soon. Uh, and you know, obviously this is in exile. Um, these, uh, these are words that Jeremiah, um, who warned for years that if the people did not repent of their sin, judgment would happen. Then judgment happened to them in the form of the destruction of the nation and the exile and scattering of the people to Egypt, to Babylon, and elsewhere. And now is this word of hope. And so prophetic preaching has to include hope. And the hope is in the agency of God who will, who will um, do all this restorative work. And it, it's, it's full of poetry and imagery that um, it's hard for the modern person to hear, but just let me just pull out a little bit. And by the way, you can tell Jeremiah had an early version of the Psalter. There's actually an, an essay in, in the Journal of Biblical Literature a number of years ago about Jeremiah's Psalter, which is a really long essay. Uh, but you can hear echoes of so many of the Psalms of Ascent and of Psalm 30 in here. Uh, but just, just check out verse 12. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock. So, um, so that's the three areas of Israel's agriculture. The grain, then the oil and the wine, which is the vineyard and then the flock. And so, I mean, so you're getting this picture of the whole place restored and coming to life again. And then it's got this great image. The young women will rejoice in the dance and the young and old men shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy, which is a reference uh, to Psalm 30. It, and it is full, I mean, I, I offer that just as a way of understanding the poetic imagery and the goodness, Jeremiah, who is, you know, preaching in the ruins of the hope that he's calling forth in God. I greatly appreciate that. I'm not going to add anything to it. It is so important for us to remember that the prophetic voice is, uh, if I turn all the way back to what Caroline was saying from John, it is light in the darkness. It is hope in the horror. Thank you for that. Okay, good. Psalm 147, which is before 148. We had 148 last week. Just saying. It's a community hymn of praise. I yes. know Matt, Matt always worries about how we classify Psalms. That was his first question, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> That's why I went to seminary and got a graduate degree. I, I, I just really wanted to be able to classify the world around me. Yeah, to class, especially the Psalms, though, right? Uh, yeah, I just, I just something about reading those 19th century German form critics just got me all excited. <laughs> anyway, no, it's a beautiful Psalm. Again, uh, it's, I, I like Psalms that describe God that, like, clearly, right? God does X, God does Y, God does Z. And uh, this one does that. Not yeah, that. It, it, Christmas it's a time, eh? Yeah, and it's a great liturgical response to the first reading, you know, uh, where where because it's, it's about Jerusalem again, uh, picturing Jerusalem as the embodiment of the people that will be restored. And uh, I commend people to Nancy's uh, commentary on the website. Um, and in this, uh, you can also refer back to my commentary from uh, last week about the snow. Uh, and it's unnecessary freezing of water that Caroline likes to quote um, 
Is it Rob Reiner or his dad? I can't remember which Reiner. Carl. Carl, his dad. Yep. 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 Good. Okay. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Where do you want to go here? Well, we talked a little bit about adoption last week, and here it is again yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in this, um, which is one place that a, a preacher could go. This idea of being blessed with every spiritual blessing is, on the one hand, too general to be of any real good. Uh, but if a preacher started to enumerate what some of those blessings might be and got it more specific, that could be really interesting as well, uh, especially around, around Christmas time. It's this, I don't know, it's this lovely... I was going to say statement. It's a really long statement. It's a pretty detailed statement uh, in the start of Ephesians about, you know, what is ours in Christ? Well, and I think too, uh, this, this claim, particularly as it resonates with, uh, with John, the first verses of John, uh, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, so there's this, this wider sort of sense of, of recognition of God's, uh, uh, God's intention for, uh, for, for who would be God's children, uh, extending all the way before, you know, before the, the world is even created. And so this is part of God's, uh, we are uh, Jesus and now us, part of God's creative activity that we see ourselves um, not just not just created by God, but uh, but that that this is God. This has been God's intention all along, and so I think there's something um, I think there's something you could do with the sermon, particularly when you think of that's how John locates to uh, the origins of Jesus are from the beginning um, b before the world was even made. So I think there's giving witness to the, uh, that continuity of God and uh, the breadth of God's vision <laughs> that is way bigger than, uh, than we can ever articulate.